I, uh, I specialize in enigmatic titles. It's not an attempt to get you interested in the talk, more a, um, I suffer what's called um, abstract regret. Um, suff submitting something to a conference, and then six months later, when you come to write the talk, realizing you don't want to write the talk you wrote the abstract for uh, all, those, all those months ago. Um, so yeah, slightly, slightly enigmatic title, but it is actually relevant to the talk. Um, one little health warning I should give. Um, uh, this talk is about a year old, um, and there's a little clue at the end of some new stuff I've been working on. Uh, so if you like this talk enough, that uh, I'm, I'm not lynch lynched at the end of it, and you're intrigued enough um, by, by the new stuff I've got in the pipeline, then perhaps I can uh, come back and show, you the, show the new stuff um, some other time. But are we there yet? Um, so who I am, um, I think some of you know me as the author of this book, Kanban from the Inside. Um, Despite appearances to the contrary, it is just the one book, and the one below is the translation into German. Um, I have a copy of it, I can't, I can't read it, but it's, <laughs> it's quite a cool thing uh, to think that someone went to the trouble of, uh, of, of translating, um, translating your book. Um, my, in terms of my background, uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, I was a global development manager for fixed income securities at UBS uh, until the credit crunch came. Um, like a lot of people, um, I left uh, UBS in 2009. Um, I went on there from there to be IT director for a late-stage um, startup in the en energy risk management sector. It was actually a former colleague of mine from UBS um, helped found the company. Um, he came back to UBS and I took his old job. I'm not quite sure how that's supposed to work. Um, but that, uh, that experience, uh, working for uh, still quite a small company, 50-odd people, and had a small uh, development team um, within that, was the case study for my book. Uh, it was a British-owned company uh, with their operation centre in, in, in Budapest, which is why there's a picture of Budapest on the front cover. People never seem to work out what the picture's of, I don't blame them, but that's where it comes from. What I've been doing in the last year or so um, is putting this thing called um, Agenda Shift together. Um, and I'll be a just a little clue about it at the end, but basically um, it's a spin-off from the book. Um, what originally started out as just a, a, like a bullet point list checklist at the end of the book um, became, first of all, a spreadsheet that got sent around um, as an assessment tool. Um, one of my uh, friends in the Kanban community, Matt Phillip, um, came over to the UK uh, a year and a half ago now um, to explain his experience of using it as a coaching tool uh, with his company in the States. Um, I was rightly embarrassed at the idea of people emailing spreadsheets around. It's, it's not something I like to receive, and I, it's even worse to have to you know, get the results back and collate them. Uh, so I productized that, put it online, uh, and you'll see the results in a minute of a survey uh, based on that tool uh, that I ran last year. Uh, and then I built, you know, other, other stuff around that, um, training, coaching tools, and, and, and things like that. So that's, that's a gender shift. Um, but back to the problem in hand. Are we there yet? So on a scale of one to four, are we there yet? Um, barely started, early gains, getting there, nailing it consistently. Um, quite hard to answer as a general question. Um, but if we get a bit more specific, um, might be able to answer it. So, is your delivery process visible? On a scale of one to four, uh, do you feel that it's visible? Can you see where every piece of work that you're doing sits in that process? Can you see who's working on what? Uh, which work items are blocked and why? Uh, are you reviewing your progress frequently? And a slightly awkward one to, to read out, policies that govern our progress are made explicit and are regularly reviewed. Um, I will say after reading that, that one out, um, we actually worked quite hard on the text um, since this was originally done. We've done several iterations on it, a little bit of a sort of collaborative, collaborative effort. Um, but just look at those and remind yourself of the scoring scale at the bottom from one is barely started, if at all, two is early gains, three is getting there, four is naming it uh, consistently. Looking at those prompts, are you mostly ones and twos, twos and threes, threes and fours? I'll just give you, give you a moment to, uh, to decide. So who, who's got the, you know, the courage to admit that they're mostly ones and twos in their team? 
Oh, we're all doing pretty well in Milton Keynes. No, no hands go up. Oh, who, who's it? Are the other... Your teams, your, you, if you want to, your wider organisation, your end-to-end -end process would be a good thing to think about. I'll give you, I'll give you. So if I, if I broaden it to your end-to-end -end -to -end process, um, how many ones and twos? Oh, a few more go up. Oh, okay. There's still, still not too many. That's pretty good. Uh, twos and threes? Yeah, quite a few. Um, threes and fours? Now it's getting harder now. Um, mainly fours. Um, I've asked this at a few, a few conferences. Um, I once got a hand go up from John Terry of LeanKit. I think he felt he had to say he was mostly fours at LeanKit you know, as a vendor of a, of a Kanban tool. Um, also, when I did Agile North last year or the year before, um, there was a team from the BBC there um, who, who claimed mostly fours. And I actually believe them, having, having worked with some of, the, some of those people. Um, so this is, how, this is how this works. Um, we've got one category here, transparency. Um, that category, oh, I've got a prompt here, excuse me. Um, that category corresponds to a value. Um, the first nine chapters of my book, in fact, were nine values. Um, transparency, uh, c balance, collaboration, uh, customer focus, flow, leadership, understanding, agreement, and respect. Um, I've collapsed those last four onto one to make just six categories. Um, but this is the basic idea of how the, how the um, assessment tool works. Different ways that you can exemplify the different values in your organization, in your development process, and, and so on. And these are the results I got. Um, so the, t the 2015 survey, um, hard to read the numbers, um, certainly from the back, um, but the overall message um, is a little bit depressing. So globally, I got more ones and twos than I did threes and fours. Um, in the strongest ca uh, c category, which is one at the top left, uh, transparency, uh, slightly, I think I've got those numbers the wrong way around. It was, uh, no, even there, 46% to 54%. And quite a range within those. So basically, everyone's having stand-up meetings. So that's good. Um, but looking, stepping back and reviewing the effectiveness of the process end-to-end -end is hardly happening at all. Um, so that's, that was the, the first finding from transparency. At the other end of the scale, so the second worst category, in fact, those last two categories, balance and customer focus, um, they traded places very, very evenly matched as the worst performing category of the whole, whole survey. Um, so the vast majority, or significant majority, ones and twos, um, our system has a clear commitment point that separates potential work from work in progress. Not too bad on that. Um, teams have realized that um, starting work willy-nilly isn't a good idea. Having a conversation with a customer that makes it clear when a piece of work is or isn't started is a good idea. On the other hand, uh, this one, we take care not to overburden the system with more work in progress than it can accommodate effectively. Um, We've improved the wording of that one since then, but the message is clear. Um, teams are working with more work in progress than they can accommodate effectively. Their effectiveness is compromised um, to the detriment of themselves as the people doing the work and the customers that the re recipients of the work. That's actually quite depressing. You know, and you think, um, you know, 15 years after the Agile Manifesto, um, you know, five plus years since uh, Kanban has been reasonably well, well known, um, that we may, we'd be in better shape than that. So we're looking a bit about how these things actually, actually work. So we're gonna focus on those two main categories, transparency and balance. Um, we will touch on collaboration and flow. Um, the leadership and customer focus categories, um, not in this talk, maybe in the next talk if I come back. And what we're going to do this is looking at the feature band game. Can I quick show of hands? Has anyone actually played the feature band game? Uh, one, one hand at the back. Um, any slide you see in yellow in, in this talk um, is covered by this Creative Commons license. Um, so I op open sourced this a couple of years ago. Um, that's enabled people to adapt it, um, translate it, and, and, and ver done various things with it. Um, very simple way of explaining uh, how can man works, and also why you might want to use it. So here's um, 
This is the um, meetup group in Derby playing it um, early last year, I think it was. Oh, it's summer before, a year and a half ago. Uh, so they're in groups of uh, four or five people around what looks like a, a little Kanban board. Uh, it's just a A3 size uh, piece of card with some, some post-it notes on it. Um, and the, way, the good thing about Feature Band, compared with other, other Kanban simulation games you may have looked at, um, is that it starts simple, and then we just add things on to make it a little bit more sophisticated. You get the hang of it very quickly. Uh, without being overwhelmed by lots of detail um, at the beginning of the game. So visual management, uh, visualizing our works, these are different things we're going to deliver. Uh, and here we're delivering a rather exotic car. I mean, it has the basic things like steering wheel and engine and carpets and so on, but it also has a flux capacitor and an ejector seat and, and so on. So one of the things that teams do is actually um, generate their, their backlog of, of features to um, deliver. Also, um, some idea that there's some workflow involved. Uh, work starts from ready, it finishes at complete, and there are two in-progress um, states in the middle. Uh, again, it's up to the teams to decide what to call them, you know, design and build, or build and test, or whatever. Um, but going a bit beyond the sort of very basic to do, doing and done that you, you might have seen of the, uh, you know, the simplest um, Kanban designs. And then there's a coin. So, a question to throw open to you. What do you think the coin might represent? Any guesses? 50-50 chance. 50 50 chance. Chance is not a bad answer. Risk. Risk very good answer. Value. Value uh, it could, but it doesn't. I'll go with the chance and 50 50 and um, risk um, answers. It's to introduce what the lean guys would call variation. Now, I don't know how it works in Milton Keynes, but what I've seen elsewhere is that when people uh, start, well, people say they're going to start a one-day piece of work. And rather than that piece of work taking one day, uh, it takes two days, or it takes three days, or it takes five days, or, it, or however long, eight days, 20 days. Um, does that ever happen in Milton Keynes? It does. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> I thought everything was all shiny and wonderful here. Anyway, um, so that's what the, co the coin injects. Uh, we'll see how that works. Um, some people say the coin might represent a decision point in the way, in the way it does. It does tell you what to do um, in the game. So heads I win. Uh, I've got an item here. It's got my initials on it, MB. Uh, and I'm allowed to advance one of my items. So I move the steering wheel from column two to column three. Or I might start a new item. So I take an item out of the ready column, and I stick my initials on it, and I move it to the first in progress um, column. Or if one of my items has been blocked, I can unblock it. Now, we, we show items as being blocked in a slightly unusual way in the game. We just write the letter B on it. Um, we're already working with quite small stickies, and to put another sticker on top to show that it's blocked all gets a bit too, uh, bit too fiddly. Um, so we simulate it with uh, just writing, writing on it and, and crossing out. So here, um, I'm crossing out a B, so what was blocked is now unblocked. I have one last option. If I have no other option available, I can pair up with someone who threw tails. Um, and I will stress if no <coughs> other option available. In this case, I do have other options. I have the steering wheel I could move. I could start a new item. So I'm not actually able to help Nick in this case. So that's all good. Good news if I throw heads. If I throw tails, not quite so good. Um, what well, is Nick here has thrown tails? He has to block an item, one of his items, I should, I should stress. Uh, so he's blocked the flux capacitor, lacking its energy source, I guess. Um, but what do you do when you get stuck? I've given the answer away already. I, I usually uh, a bit hold, hold back with the clicker here. Um, when you get stuck, so often, I'm, I've seen it time and time again, people start another piece of work. Uh, people don't like to be sat around while nothing is happening because they're waiting on a dependency or waiting for help or uh, whatever needs to happen to resolve their, their blocker. So we block a piece of work and we start um, something new. Quite realistic, people tell me. So cross-check now. Um, 
Feature Banner is a game that's des designed to illustrate Kanban. Here we're looking at uh, three of the six uh, core practices of Kanban. Uh, visualize, make policies explicit, implement feedback loops. And we're looking pretty good, lots of green ticks there. We're visualizing our work items, our workflow, and the state of the work. Uh, we've got the rules of the game all nicely laid out, so that's policies. Um, feedback loops. Um, feedback loops, just to, just to explain, posh word for bringing people and information together uh, at a point where they can make decisions. Um, so the, the, the daily stand-up meeting where they toss their coins and uh, tell each other what moves they're going to make um, is a simple feedback loop. Um, when they run out of work, um, they also need to talk to each other about what um, new work they want to generate. So the replenishment meetings also um, uh, counts as a feedback loop. All sounds really good. Uh, we can uh, look at our assessment. Is our delivery process visible? Yes, it is. Uh, where each work item is, what, who's working on, on what, and so on. Um, short version, all threes and fours. Um, so we appear to be doing better than a good number of you in the room, or the, or the policies of a good number of you in the room in terms of how we set, set the game up. All sounds great. So this is the result. Um, this is, we're at the skills funding agency here where I was an interim delivery manager for a while. Um, this is Carl holding up his board. And how would you describe the state of that board? Too much whip. Too much whip. Yes, a nice technical explanation. A more colloquial explanation. <laughs> That's a very colloquial explanation. Right, they're not in a good place. A uh, polite version for the camera. Um, all starting and no finishing, perhaps. You know, they got everything into that first in progress column, but they've only managed to deliver two items. Um, yeah, not, not, not brilliant. Um, does this feel like your workplace, perhaps? Um, lots of starting. You know, your, your manager says, oh, when are we going to start this? When are we going to start this? When are we going to start this? Um, very common management behavior. Um, so you get things started, you get things started, then you've got 10 things going at once. Uh, you're continually context switching between those 10 things. Um, you introduce quality problems because of all that context switching, picking up something that you were working on a week ago. Uh, the world changing around you while you're failing to deliver stuff and so on. It just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, so that's you know, a simple explanation. Uh, for, for what we're seeing. Uh, we can use the tools to give us some more, more clues. Um, so does our process balance demand with capacity? Um, clearly it doesn't. You know, every time we block something, we're going to start a new piece of work. Um, that's going to go from completely out of control. If you, ran, if you ran this game forever, you'd have an in infinite amount of work on your board. Um, not very healthy. Our delivery process has a clear commitment point that separates potential work from work in progress. Well, it kind of has a commitment point, but because we're starting work willy-nilly, it's pretty meaningless. Uh, we pull work into and across the delivery process only as capacity allows, um, no attempt uh, to do that. Uh, we prefer to finish work items already in progress than to start new work items. Um, I might be, to be honest, I might be a bit harsh with the one here, um, but I'm reflecting what... Um, you know, other people have said uh, when they've played the game. I think I might give them a two. We keep our work in progress in healthy balance based on tight source and customer expect expectations. If we had different customers, for example, or if we had customers um, that had some fixed date work, some um, background work, uh, some drop everything work, uh, we've got no mechanisms for man managing a, ho a, you know, a healthy mix of those things. Um, in scheduling releases, we balance economic value with delivery cost. Um, and given that a two, um, we don't worry about delivery cost. It kind of isn't really any. You know, we toss a coin and we can choose what we move. Uh, we don't fret about um, how difficult a release is to make, for example. Um, so I guess the game, uh, all, all those stages seem equally e easy. We've either got the same uh, brilliant level of automation at every stage or, or none at all. Um, but those kind of considerations don't hold us back. Um, but neither do we have much of an idea of what our different features are worth. Um, neither do we deliver features in any kind of sensible order. 
and te teams actually, after a few minutes of playing, suddenly realise that they haven't got a car at all. You know, they've got a steering wheel, carpets and a mirror. Um, no way to integrate those things, no way to test those things. You would, wouldn't dare show a pile of those parts to a customer. Um, so not much sense of value either. Um, so the remedy, I think we've, got a, we've had a clue over here from what the remedy might be. Uh, and in the game, we introduced some work in progress limits. And for those of you that haven't seen um, those before, uh, we just stick uh, some limits, those numbers above the two in progress columns on the board. And the rule is very simple. We can't move an item into a column that's already full. So if a column with a three on it has already got three items in it, we can't move more work into it. We don't move anything back. If we start the, start the game as um, Carl did, I'll start this phase with, as Carl did with you know, um, several items on the board. Uh, we don't move those back. Um, we use this as an intervention to get this terrible situation under control. Um, when we actually play the game, I've got the rules up on, on the screen. Uh, people often have a printed copy of the rules as well, and they can compare the rules from round one to round two, iteration one and iteration two. Um, and I want them to double check that the only rule I've changed is the work in progress limit. I'm not cheating. Um, let's see what happens. So if I throw heads, uh, this is fine. I can move my steering wheel uh, from the first in progress column to the second one. I can't move, I can't start a new item uh, because that column's full. Can I move Nick's item, the flux capacitor? No, that's good. Got the answer right. Most people shout out yes because there's this capacity in that um, third column. Um, but it's not my item. I have other options. I can move the steering wheel, so that's okay. Uh, Nick can. Uh, Kevin could as well if Kevin was playing. Uh, there's nothing with a there's nothing with a K um, on the board. Much better. Uh, big sigh of relief from uh, from from Carl. Um, Lynn at the back has you know delivered so much work. She needs a drink of water. Um, the dynamics of the system are you know just completely transformed just by that simple device of getting the work in progress under control. Um, we look at our little assessment again. Uh, are we now balancing demand with capacity? Well, we've gone from a one to a three. Uh, we're certainly trying to get um, capacity, balancing our demand with capacity. Um, but to be fair, we don't actually know what our capacity is. We haven't, um, whether through experimentation or trying to work it out from first principles, we don't know what the width limits actually should be. Um, I've just said, stick a three above those two columns. Um, our delivery process has a clear commitment point that separates potential work from work in progress. Um, I've moved that up one because the, the commitment point's now a lot more meaningful. Uh, we're only allowed to move work into the system if there's um, capacity. Uh, if you were talking to your customer about whether you were going to start something or not uh, in the game, you would say, sorry, uh, we've got other things we need to finish uh, before we start your one. Um, we pull work into and across the delivery process only as capacity allows. A big change has gone from one to four, and the next one, we prefer to finish work items in progress um, than to start new ones. Um, there's still some at the bottom they're not, not doing so well at, ones and twos, um, but much, 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 much healthier. Slightly surprisingly, um, but maybe it won't come as a vast surprise, uh, without trying to um, address any questions about flow, um, we've actually made some improvements there already. Um, the predictability of our delivery improves significantly. We're not measuring it yet, but it certainly feels more predictable. Um, and um, you know, the team are beginning to work together uh, to resolve um, you know, issues of flow across the board. Um, and this for me, is that perhaps one of the stunning things about playing the game is just li listening to the volume of noise in the room compared to playing iteration one and iteration two. In iteration one, the rules say you throw your coins, you decide what move you're going to take, and you tell your, col your colleagues what you're going to do, and you make your moves. In iteration two, 
when their work in progress is limited, they realize very quickly uh, that they want to get things from, uh, that are close to completion off the board to make space for other things to move in behind. Uh, they want to move things out of column two uh, to column three so that new stuff can be started and so on. Um, and they realize that by sequencing uh, the moves of the different players and by choosing who helps whom uh, when you know, one player throws tails and, an and another throws heads, um, they can get much more done. Um, so suddenly, um, from no collaboration to lots of collaboration, again, just through the simple device of limiting our work in progress. Um, I have seen this in real life. Um, in fact, I've seen it several times. Um, how, who here, um, they're visualizing their work and they can say that you know, the majority of the time, there is less work in progress than there are developers on their development team. Is that something you've seen? I have seen that a few times, and it's teams where there is um, significant amounts of pairing going on between developers, but also where the attitude of developers is that if they've got work in, uh, in test, um, that they are working with, uh, with their test teams to get stuff across, and that takes priority over starting more, more development work. Um, So we, looking at those individual questions, our delivery process is not constrained by functional structure. That doesn't really come into this game. Um, it's already a four. Um, people don't have roles. People aren't tied to columns. They start a piece of work from the beginning, and they can move it across to the end. Um, they do meet frequently, the daily stand-up meeting, the simulated stand-up meeting, to work out what they're going to do. Um, and that improves significantly. It's gone from a two to a three. Um, we meet regularly to review performance and identify opportunities for improvement. Well, we're just beginning to do that. We're beginning to talk about how we can um, improve our system um, relative to where it was before. We frame improvements as safe to fail experiments. Not really. Um, I think I'm being generous here um, with a two. Um, this was me as the facilitator saying, Stick, three, stick those work in progress limits on the board. Uh, there was no negotiation with the team. Uh, the team wasn't given the opportunity to come up with the idea. They didn't have the opportunity to um, work out what a good limit might be, and so on. Um, not, not really that experimental. So quick cross-check again um, with the um, practices, the remaining three uh, practices of the method. We are now uh, demonstrating limiting work in progress. We've taken our Kanban board and turned it into a true Kanban system. So a Kanban system is where you've got visual management and you've got controls in work in progress that gives you pull um, through your system. You don't start work until you've got the capacity to start on it. When you finish something, that creates a signal that work can move, move through your systems. Uh, manage flow. Um, well, we certainly see more flow than we had. It certainly feels better, feels smoother. Uh, we're getting through stuff um, more quickly. Um, but we don't really know when things are needed. We don't really know how fast things are actually needed. So it's hard to say that we've got timeliness. And as we said before, um, not really much of a sense in the game of economic outcomes. It's very easy to, to build a pile of parts rather than something integratable, something demonstrable, um, those kind of things. Um, and corresponding to that, the customer doesn't really feature in the process at all. Improve collaboratively, evolve experimentally. Um, that's the practice I find is hardest, hardest to say. Um, the value that goes with that one is collaboration, and we certainly do improve collaboration. Um, but there's not, as I said, there's not an experimental process of improvement um, going on here. The process, the delivery process might be getting more collaborative, but the way we change it, not really. Um, iteration three is about metrics. I'm gonna just whiz through this quickly. Um, the point of these slides um, is just to show how easy it is uh, to generate some really good quality metrics um, from running your system. Um, so here's a simple cumulative flow diagram. Um, who's seen a cumulative flow diagram before? <coughs> about half of you. Um, this is a really boring one, doesn't tell you very much, uh, but at least uh, you can understand how it's constructed. And on the next slide, we'll show a much more interesting one. Um, so all the cumulative, cumulative flow diagram is, it's like a burn up chart on steroids. 
Um, so the bottom, the bottom line is your overall burn-up. Those are the tickets that we've delivered. Uh, so at the beginning of iteration two, we started with six complete, well, in iteration three, three, sorry, we started with six complete, and by the end, uh, we had 15. That's our burn-up. And we do that just by counting cards in the, um, the, that last column. Those other bands are um, obtained by counting the cards in those other columns. Uh, so in the column prior to the last one, so in our, you know, it might be the test column or the ready for deployment column or whatever, um, we had, how many cards is that? That's three, is it, I'm guessing. Uh, then none for a little bit, then one or two, then a few, and so on. Um, and then the, the next column, our, our build column, perhaps it might be, uh, that's a, had a fairly steady um, number of cards in it. I, I guess it's mostly three, but occasionally it drops down to two or one. Uh, it's mostly three because of the work in progress limit. And then at la the last one, these are the ones that we haven't started yet. And we started with, um, I guess that's about that's no eight or nine um, at the beginning. Uh, out of the, the total of 20 that we started with, so the other 12, 11 or 12 have been delivered already. Uh, our total number stays the same until we nearly running out of items and we add some more. So we started with a scope of 20, as we call it, and then we ended up with a scope of 25 after we added some more. And we're steadily eating away at that as we start new items. Um, so all we're doing is counting, counting cards and then stacking those lines up. Um, in Excel, it's a stacked area chart. It's very easy to produce. Um, what it gives you is actually a burn-up for every stage in your process. Uh, we can see how much work we've actually decided to, uh, to put in the ready column. Uh, we can see how much work we've started. We can see how much work has come out of that first column, how much work's come out of that second column, and so on. That's how it's constructed, um, but a very boring picture. Um, this is a much more um, realistic one. This is a real one. This is the, this is the one from my case study from my book. Um, just briefly, you've got the ballooning of work that you see at the beginning of a project. You've got those big staircases. Staircases in CFDs are where you've got big batches of work going from one stage to another. So we've stored up a lot of work here. This dark green is ready for release. We've stored up a lot of work in ready for release. Um, but not released it. Then very quickly, we um, release a whole wadge of it, uh, nearly 40 items, of which uh, 25 odd, uh, we can, we've got very quick confirmation from the customer that those items are adding value to them. So um, I think nowadays I would call that the validated column at the, at the time. This is about 2010, 2011, before the Lean Startup book came out. Um, if it had been post lean startup, we'd have called that validated, but we called it implemented. This is where we knew we delivered, had delivered something of um, value. So, balloony of work, staircases, um, and this quite embarrassing wadge of dark green, or nearly dark green, mid green, in the middle. That's the work we got ready for release, but not released. Um, and this doesn't tell us why we didn't have it released but it does certainly tell us the story of the state of our project at the time. Um, the, reason, um, the reason it wasn't released was not technical. Um, it's much more down to people. You could call it politics, if you like. Um, the, the long and short of it is that the project was sponsored by the MD, but it wasn't the MD who was going to get a, a call at 5 o'clock in the morning if the system didn't work. Um, the operations director... Uh, was actually quite understandably reluctant to implement a big new system that was going to be potentially quite disruptive uh, to his team. And so you could say that this delay here was, was the time it took to build up some trust with the operations team. Um, it does end a lot happier, hap more happily. You know, we go from these big releases to much smaller releases, and up here, um, if I could draw the further to the right, um, a much more continuous style of delivery. Um, by here, we'd automated our deployment um, process. It, any, literally any member of the team could do a deployment, and it was a one-line command. It was a one-line command to roll it back. Uh, we had high confidence in our tests and, and so on. 
Uh, so we went from not being allowed to do releases for months to doing multiple releases per week. A much happier situation. Um, anyway, that's just the story of your project as a bit of an aside. Um, the CFT, I'll be honest with you, it's not a tool that I use every day. Uh, it was a tool to every now and then to, to describe you know, the, the story of the project so far it can be really powerful. Um, and it will remind you, you know, where tons of work got stuck. And you'll think about why that was and what you did about it. Um, and if you see um, these common patterns like ballooning, staircases, and continuous delivery, it's very nice to see you go from one pattern to the next. Certainly very satisfying uh, to, to, uh, to see yourselves going into a, con into a more continuous uh, mode. Um, run chart, not that very easy one to do. Um, so it took uh, three days to deliver that first item, three days to deliver that second one, uh, five days, seven days, and so on. Um, and it just prompts you to ask, well, what on earth happened there? So why did that one seem to take 10 days? Um, did it keep getting blocked? So why was that? You know, you're, you've got rubbish coins. You keep t throwing tails. <laughs> Uh, in the game. In real life, obviously, the, 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 the explanation might be a bit more interesting. It might just have been that that piece of work just got swamped by everything else. It was never important enough uh, to get attention. It might never have been blocked. It was just stalled. Uh, and it took 10 days for that, that reason. Um, you might even consider that's OK uh, for a piece of work to be delayed in favor of um, more important work. Um, that being the case, though, why did you even start it? Why did you start a piece of work that um, you had not much intention of, of finishing? So anyway, the interesting questions you can ask about a piece of work that took longer than usual. Um, so quick, just to check that you're awake. Um, how many items took three days? Three. Uh, how many items took seven days? One. One, yep. What I can do, for, for each of the numbers of days, um, we can produce a histogram, so we get a distribution of how long things took. Um, two items took two days, three took three days, uh, and as we heard, one item took seven days, and there's that R outlier over here as well. Um, and that's a very common shape. Um, don't let anyone tell you you should expect a bell curve. Uh, you won't. Um, it's quite obvious why. You can't deliver it in minus three days. It's not going to be... Um, know, in any way symmetric. Um, usually a steep front to it and a long tail. Very common pattern. Um, the cumulative line, so 100% of our items were done in 10 days, um, none at one days, as you'd expect. Um, so it just helps us read off some, some other statistics. So the median, the middle, the middle one took three days. And we, could, we could call that our typical item. An item is as likely to take more than three days as it is to take less than three days. Um, would you go to your customer and say, we're, we deliver in three days? You'd be mad to. <laughs> um, you can deliver half your items in three days, but the other half is going to take, take longer than that, typically. Um, you might say, um, well, okay, we can deliver 85% of our items in less than seven days. Um, and that's without even trying. That's just, that's just the normal expectation. Um, but given the, given the need to hand carry something through the system, as long as there's no horrible nasties lurking inside it, we can probably be pretty confident about, about that sort of time. Um, so if you can make, agree make agreements, it's actually quite a good idea to have some idea of what your distribution actually looks like. And it's very easy to construct if you're not, not doing this already. Um, I've had other case studies. I, I, I didn't incorporate them into the deck where um, I drew charts like this from real data. Uh, one chart here and then another chart next to it six, day, six weeks later showing a quite significant improvement in performance. Um, so that's another reason for... Um, for producing these things, not just for making commitments, uh, but also celebrating the fact that we'd made some um, really healthy um, improvements to our performance. Um, David Anderson, you know, the guy who wrote the original Kanban book, thinks the lead time histogram is the most useful metric that you can produce. Um, certainly, I've got more value out of it than I have out of CFDs. Um, but CFDs is always the textbook one that people go to first. 
So some key st statistics. I've mentioned um, the median and the 85th percentile already. The mean, um, um, you all know what a mean is. The trouble with the mean is that it's skewed very much by those outliers. That 10-day one is going to have a hor you know, quite a big impact um, on your mean. Um, so you can either you know, censor the, the outliers or um, just not use, it, use the median instead. Um, flow efficiency is the last one. I haven't explained that. Who's seen flow efficiency before? One, one person. Um, this is a sus suspiciously high number. And there's actually evidence on the um, histogram that's been some cheating going on. Um, just, it, just visualize in your mind what the board looked like. How many heads does it take to get a, board, a, a, a ticket across the board? Three. Three. And yet we're getting items delivered in two days. Um, something a bit fishy going on. Um, you might think, well, okay, we, can, uh, we, we might have three team members um, throw heads and um, move an item across the board in one go. Um, I, you haven't seen the, the detailed rules, but the rules dis didn't, in, didn't allow for that behavior. Um, I talk about pairing up to help someone. I didn't say all of you use your, one or use your coins to, to move um, single items. Um, so this team cheated, basically. 68%, very high number. Um, I would be staggered if I saw 68% in most development teams. Um, it's usually way, way lower than that. I'll explain just how low it can get, and um, we'll see how it's calculated. So for one item, the flow efficiency is the ratio of the useful value-adding touch time to the overall time it takes to get the work through the system. Um, so we've, as we already, already said, it takes three heads to move a piece of work across the board. So here's the story of one item. We threw heads to start it. We then threw tails and it got blocked. We had to use a head not to move the item along, but to unblock it. That's work we would rather not have done. That's fixing a bug we put into our code. Um, we then threw a head that allowed us to move it. Um, on day five, it didn't matter what we threw. Uh, why do you think that might be? Sorry? Uh, that's a possible reason. Uh, so we were unable to move it because the next column was full. Uh, there's even a more mundane explanation than that. An error date didn't show again? No. <laughs> the fact is, we just chose to move something else. That's the thing, and this is again the, ma the magic of uh, getting your work in progress under control. Um, the reason why stuff doesn't move is because we are, well, we can only do one thing at a time. We're human. Um, so that, you know, to use the jargon, that piece of work was stalled for a day. It wasn't blocked, nothing wrong with it, um, but we, our attention was elsewhere. We chose to work on, on something else. Um, finally, day six, we threw heads. Uh, so we threw four, possibly five heads out of six, but we got a flow efficiency of only 50%. Um, with a lot more work on the board, um, actually we'd, we'd spend a lot more time stalled, so our flow efficiency would be, would be significantly lower than 50%, ev even just running, running the game, which is very simple. Um, now, so think back to real life. Um, now, suppose you work in an environment, and I'm, I'm going back, perhaps back a few years, but I, I can certainly remember working environments where a typical piece of work took five days development. Sound reasonable? A um, couple of days testing, that's seven. But you do a release every six weeks. Sounds not too bad so far. We've got one, week, one week's work out of six weeks. But we run our development and QA and deployment cycles kind of in parallel. So when we're building one system, we're testing the previous version and we're deploying the version before that. So even though we're releasing every six weeks, our actual lead time is more than is, is 18 weeks. Even more if you count things like analysis and things like, things like that. So a week out of 18, um, that's not much more than 5%. 5% Efficiency, does that sound good? <laughs> it doesn't sound good. That's the, that's the, that's the, the, the beauty or the cunning of, of, of the name. Um, 
for many, certainly more traditional development processes, um, you have flow efficiencies in the single digits. They just don't sound good. Um, but how do you improve it? Get everyone working faster? Makes very, very little difference. The problem isn't the time that people are spending working. It's the time that work items are sitting there, not going anywhere. It's the time you're working on five things at once. It's the time your work is sitting, waiting to be tested. Um, it's the time your work has been tested, but is waiting to be deployed. Um, those kind of things. Um, so it's squeezing those, you could say squeezing those delays out of the system. That sounds like a very lean thing to do, but actually it's just understanding where work hangs around and being less tolerant of that. Um, that's a sort of end-to-end -end macro version of limiting your work in progress um, that significantly improves your lead time and is reflected in your, in your flow efficiency number. So when you scare your management with a really bad sounding number, um, flow efficiency is one to, one to try. Um, so it's management, so it, it's, it's a metric that's very much focused on the work, not on the people. It's not about how busy people are. Uh, resource efficiency is the term that, um, or utilization is, is the term. It's how it looks from the work items perspective. And ultimately, it's the actual work that gets delivered is what delivers value to the customers, to, to the organization. Um, it's a slightly sideways way of improving efficiency, um, but it works. This is the you know, kind of the lean story. Uh, you improve this, the efficiency and effectiveness of your processes by focusing it, first of all, from the point of view, not of the people doing the work, but from the point of view of the work items themselves. That's flow efficiency. That's, so we've had three iterations. We've done our basic version where it was all crazy. No starting, sorry, tons of starting, no finishing. Then we got our work in progress under control and we certainly felt a significant improvement in the um, effectiveness of our system. We then showed how easy it was to generate some metrics that actually showed how much more effective it was. Um, the next iteration, um, I actually never actually play this one, we just discuss it, and we discuss just how unrealistic um, the game is relative to our, our work lives, but at the same time, just how easy it would be to adapt the game to reflect more the realities of working life. So we could, for example, think about where one team is upstream of another team. So you've got you know, a, um, a team doing user research and UX upstream of a development team, for example. Uh, that was a very common pattern in the government digital projects that I, I worked in. Um, you might have a, a, a third team after that, you know, a team doing testing, deployment, um, those kind of things. Um, you can imagine that now as being three feature band games run in serial. Um, you can imagine where one team is dependent on another team. So you've got your development team and an infrastructure team, and uh, work has to move from one to here and then back up again before it can move out, for, for example. Um, going back to my investment banking days, uh, we were almost a cross-functional team. So there were certain things about managing the infrastructure that we weren't allowed to do on our own. Uh, so we had to go out to um, other teams to do it. Um, so just on paper, or just as a discussion, we can think about how our simple little game can be turned into something that simulates something much more realistic, something much more end-to-end, -end, something much more reflective of the challenges we have in terms of managing dependencies between team, managing flows um, across whole teams, and, and so on. Um, and some um, enterprising people are actually now, um, based on feature ban, are um, developing games of their own, and using games of their own, that, that actually do test some, some more of these, these ideas. Um, sequencing and prioritizing work, how do we do that? How do we do it so we don't build a car that just has um, you know, wing mirrors, carpets, and, and a steering wheel, for example? Um, other ways to improve performance, how could we improve quality? Um, we know that a work item gets blocked every time we throw tails, but suppose Suppose we allow a second throw in that instance. You know, if our unit test framework caught the defect right away, it doesn't really cost anything. So we'll give you a second chance. Perhaps, perhaps, the, uh, perhaps your, your, uh, your test has caught, caught the defect straight away. Um, when I'm about to get lynched, uh, because you know, teams are throwing tails all the time and not getting any work done, they get very, very frustrated 
Um, I've twice had teams from Germany complain about this. Don't know why it is about Germans. Um, um, but they've, uh, twice I've had, they've complained to me that um, they get very, very frustrated when they throw s successive tails and there's anything that we can do about it. Um, well, discuss how would you improve the quality of um, flow, the quality of your process in real life, and can we make a tweak to the rules of the game, and while we're playing the game, to simulate um, making a quality improvement. So we could do that. Um, delivering against multiple objectives, I've hinted at this already. Um, I was a little vague, in the, oh, deliberately vague actually, in the titles, but um, you might have competing customers. You might be struggling with delivering to a fixed deadline at the same time as supporting something you wrote the previous week. That's quite common. Uh, you might find it that you always delivering, always delivering, always delivering, never getting a chance to do the refactoring, the quality improvement, those kind of things. Again, quite a, col a common thing that um, I, I encounter. Um, upstream, downstream themes I've talked about, dependencies I've talked about. Um, so you're getting an idea now, although we just played just a simple game, people can actually understand how it relates to um, not just how their teams operate, and we do reflect quite a bit on how their own teams operate, you know, the, the extent to which they're over eager to start things and not disciplined enough about finishing things, um, for example. But also understand that you've actually got the beginnings of some tools here uh, to think about how um, inter-team stuff happens as well. Um, and, uh, and as soon as there are multiple teams involved in any organization, it's much harder to get things done. Uh, but if, if you can find ways to visualize that, control that, um, be aware when there's too much of it going on or there's a, you know, a backlog of work between teams that's not being, not being managed, um, for example, um, you, know, you stand a chance of delivering um, much better outcomes if you can get that kind of stuff under control. So even just as a discussion, um, this works well, and there aren't, there aren't people now um, developing workshops, uh, training, um, evening meetup games even, um, based on some of these, these bigger simulations. Uh, so Patrick Stayert, um, Belgian guy who comes over to the UK quite a lot, is doing this. Um, Andy Carmichael, some of you know. He and John Coleman have um, been, been doing this. Um, with their version of the game. So what's this really about? Um, and I'm, I've been touching on this, um, and very quickly, people begin to realize that their Kanban system is just the reflection of, what, of the real work that they're doing. That in itself is a really powerful idea. Um, the idea that you can um, just move a sticky note to reflect something that's happened in reality. Um, the fact that you feel uncomfortable when the board doesn't reflect what's actually happening, when you know that there's work that should be represented on the board that isn't up there, for example. Um, and that in itself is useful. Um, we also can just make quick tweaks to, um, to how the board works. Um, we can agree that as a team, and that instantly will have an effect on the way the actual work is done. Um, and, the, and the converse is true. If we change our process, we probably ought to change the design of our boards to reflect it. Um, but the idea that you can change your process just by rubbing a few lines out, moving a few stickers around, that's, that's amazing. That takes moments. Um, but not necessarily a lot of thought goes into it, I've certainly found. Um, you know, this stuff gets you know, discussed at stand-up meetings. Oh, if we just move that line there, it'll better reflect the work. And that's actually fine. Um, the idea of stepping back and thinking hard about how things are working, thinking hard about the root causes for why things aren't working as well as we'd like, um, those hard things aren't actually going to happen every day, and it's unrealistic, unrealistic to expect it to happen every day. Um, you know, the kind of management think that thinks, oh, if only everybody was more thoughtful, everything would be better. Um, that's actually a pipe dream. Um, we just don't have the, you know, the, the supplies of energy in our, in our brains, literally, um, to continually think about the global consequences of every small decision that we make in our day-to-day -day work. Um, to step back and deliberately appraise how things are working um, 
You need the opportunity to do it. You need the willingness to do it. You need to get people together to do it if, you're gonna, if it's going to make a significant difference and so on. Um, you actually need to design it into the way that you do work. This goes back to the survey we saw at the beginning. Everyone's doing stand-ups. No one's stepping back and looking at how things are actually working. Um, quite depressing. And I recognize the shape of that picture. I'm slightly naughty here. I, I stole somebody else's picture. Thought you might. <laughs> um, double loop learning was the was the um, was the picture I, I kind of ripped off in the, in the previous slide. Um, it's not an exact correspondence. Um, so this is Chris Argyris. Um, that top loop, that's the stuff that we can do day to day without thinking too hard. We're an autopilot when we're doing this stuff. Um, action strategy. That's basically his posh way, way of saying the stuff that we do day to day and the quick rules of thumb that we use uh, in order to decide what we're going to do day to day, um, and the results and consequences we get from that. I mean, you've heard the saying, um, you know, if you keep doing this, the same thing, was, was, it, was it madness is doing the same thing every day and expecting a different result. <laughs> um, that's what we do. You know, we don't think, well, well I was just thinking, I've, I've driven from Chesterfield today, you know, a two-hour drive, and, you know, I think I'm a good enough driver um, but I wasn't thinking about the, go, get the global consequences of every, every move I made of the steering wheel. Um, you know, it becomes um, intuitive and instinctive how you, how you drive a car. Only every now and then do you really step back and think about how things work um, and challenging really hard things like values, beliefs, assumptions, frameworks. Um, to, use the, to pursue the car analogy, am I too ready to jump in the car? You know, should I have investigated trains from Chesterfield to Milton Keynes? Um, I probably are some. <laughs> are you on the East Coast Main Line? Are you? No, you're not, no. Perhaps, I, perhaps I've had to go to London first. Perhaps it wasn't a terrible decision. Um, we do most things by habit to challenge things like values, beliefs, beliefs assumptions, and frameworks to significantly change the way we work and especially to significantly change the way we think we've got to actually make, sh we've got to make that happen because it won't happen on its own. Um, which leads me to one of my favourite pictures that David Anderson's produced, and he's, he's done a few in his time. Um, this is his feedback loops picture. So this describes, I, I use this as like a checklist. And these are all the feedback loops you could be using in, in your organisation, um, but it's rare to see all of them well and consistently uh, implemented in a way that every team understands such that they're all properly connected and so on. Um, so I, as I've said several times, everyone's doing stand-up meetings. No problem there. Um, everyone has some way of getting work into the system. So in, um, in David speak, that's the replenishment meeting. Um, everyone has a way of deciding what comes out of the system. Those two might be the same meeting. We might say we're going to plan this work together and we're going to plan to do that release as a result of it. Um, or we might say, okay, on a weekly basis, we're going to plan what goes into the system. And either on a, you know, we might do three, th a release every three months and we have a meeting big meeting to decide what is the scope of the release, what is definitely looking good for the release, what's looking a bit dodgy, what do we want definitely want to exclude. That's one uh, quite common model. Another model m might be um, we do it opportunistically. As soon as we've got a few pieces of work that look good enough to make it worth doing a release, uh, we'll do a release. Um, or there's a completely continuous version. You know, you, you, you you uh, commit your changes, they get tested automatically, and without touching the size, they're out in production. You know, we're talking the, you know, the Amazons, the Facebooks, the Googles of this world, um, you know, that, that sort of level of, of trust in their process, in their tests, um, and their ability to understand the production environment itself to know whether a change was a good one or not. Um, in that rare case, uh, the meeting goes away, but there are other, other tools for deciding what goes into the release. Um, up the middle, 
uh, quite an interesting uh, trio of feedback loops. So the stand-up meeting, the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, the service delivery review that David has championed ever since his book. Um, I'm now a champion of that meeting now. Um, it's a meeting that I've implemented now at a number of places, uh, a couple of government projects um, and in the private sector. The service delivery review. So this is where you bring together uh, customer information, uh, customer feedback, user research. Um, you talk to your help desk guys, find out what people are complaining about. Um, your net promoter scores, whatever narrative feedback you get from your customers and so on, all that stuff about your customer. Then the health of your system. So what kind of volumes are, we get, are going through it? Um, how long does it take for users to, uh, to transact a, a, a common uh, transaction in your system? Um, is it showing signs of stress from the volumes? Um, business view. What is the business doing that will change the behavior of customers, of users? Is there going to be a big marketing campaign that's suddenly going to um, increase the amount of work your system is going to see and so on? Um, delivery view. Um, so that's usually my bit. I'm usually, you know, when, I, when, I'm, when, I'm, in a, when I'm in an actual, actual delivery role, it's usually delivery manager. Um, but, you know, what, what have we got um, ready to go out? Uh, what have we just uh, finished building? Um, what are we working on? What are we planning on working next? And so on. All these different perspectives, customers' perspectives, operational perspectives, delivery perspectives, and so on, all brought together in, into one place. And it's how we make sure that all, it all stacks up. You know, are, we, are we doing all these wonderful things in development, uh, but really sort of fiddling while Rome, burn, Rome is burning because we have very unhappy customers and a sick production system, for example? Um, bringing those things together um, gives you a chance to reflect on whether you're doing um, the right things and giving appropriate, not, not down at the feature level necessarily, but whether you've got your high level priorities about right in a way that delivers um, not just immediate satisfaction to the customer, but something sustained as well, something that's going to last. So that's the service deliver delivery review. Um, if you're in a larger organization, uh, you're running multiple services, you need to make sure that you're um, allocating you know, appropriate numbers of people and um, uh, you know, money, machines, whatever it takes uh, to each of those services. They deliver the service level that they, they need to or that the appropriate allocation um, between those services is appropriate. Um, that customer-facing services and internal-facing ser uh, services are coordinating well to give, deliver good results and so on. Um, if you start and get to get to strategy now, uh, what capabilities do we need in, to, in order to deliver on uh, this business strategy that we have? Um, most of us aren't privy to those, st those strategy discussions, but we ought at least ought to be aware of um, their outputs. And over on the right, the, the risk review. Um, so what's at risk of being late, for example? Um, you might have risks about, about the market, about specific customers, internal risks, quality risks, all sorts of technology risks, um, all sorts of risks. Um, that's just some old school discipline here. You know, your project manager maintaining a risk log. Um, there's there's still some value in doing some of that stuff. Um, I used to sit when I was on uh, I was on carers allowance and apprenticeships um, as delivery manager. So there's two government um, digital projects. In both cases, um, most of the technology work um, was done by external suppliers, but the internal project management work was in house. And so it seemed very healthy that um, I, as a delivery manager, had to sit down with a project manager and we, we maintained the risk register um, together you know, with our assumptions, dependencies, issues, all that, all that traditional um, kind of stuff. And it made sure uh, we were paying attention to the right things in our process. It made sure that we had the right, um, you know, the, the right things you know, in our in our backlogs and and so on. Um, you know, if there was some critical thing that had to be met some months down the line, we ought to be planning for it and ought to plan to do a, a good job of it. So that's the risk review. Um, each of these meetings will take different forms in different organisations, but um, 
do you have a big gap there? Um, I suppose is the question. Um, from what I've seen, and from the results of that survey, um, that bottom th line of three is well represented. Um, the rest is very patchy, to put it mildly. Um, and, I, and I think when you one of the, one of the, thing, the sad things about the, as to the lack of service delivery review is that um, development teams and infrastructure teams are losing an opportunity uh, to make a good connection with their customers by, by not doing that, uh, for not, not generating right levels of empathy for the poor people using their, their awful systems, you know, the, the systems that customers aren't happy enough with, um, that deliver a poor experience, that are managed poorly from a customer um, perspective, and, and so on. Um, so if you're not doing one of those, um, I'd seriously consider um, giving it a go. Um, it's not just a Kanban thing. Um, you know, I remember doing doing this you know, 10 years ago you know, in, 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 in banks. Um, when you're talking about real stuff with real customers, that's a great way to form a decent working relationship, even if the stuff you're talking about sometimes seems hard. You know, the crash that we had last week and the work that hasn't been delivered yet uh, and so on. Um, but there's really good input you can get from them as well. You know, where is this going from a business point of view? Uh, where are the volumes going to come from? Uh, help us understand your business plan and how we fit into it and so on. Uh, that then starts to, to influence the stuff on the left, the stuff we're planning, planning to do as well. Okay, uh, service delivery review. Um, as I said, um, the easy stuff, the stuff at the bottom is being done by most people pretty consistently. Um, the maj vast majority threes and fours. Um, you know, people think they're either, you know, they're, they're getting there, they're running something that's that's halfway decent, reasonably effective, or they're fours. They think they're they think they're nailing it. Um, not so good on on the other things. Not so good at stepping back and looking at how well the whole things work. The whole thing works. But that's harder, isn't it? Um, the harder things don't happen unless you plan them into your process. Um, message of that. So this is my last slide, or apart from my sign-off slide. Um, so this is looking ahead a bit um, to the stuff I've been working on, on this year. Um, so you've seen uh, the assessments um, organized by value, and everything in, in outlined in red is the stuff that's organized by value. So um, for example, doing an, an assessment of your process, that's down in the bottom left-hand corner, that's looking at about what you actually do um, and using that as, as fuel for your agenda for change and thinking about the levels of capability that you could achieve. Um, you can feed that agenda for change from the top right as well. Uh, what is it we're really trying to do? What is the kind of organisation that we want to be? What are the capabilities that we need in order to be what we want to be, to pursue our strategy, to pursue our purpose and so on? Um, so what I'm, what I'm doing here is um, thinking about, trans uh, about lean agile transformation as something ongoing. So there's an element of discovery about it where we're continually discovering um, needs and thinking about how we're going to better meet those, uh, continually discovering better ways of working. And perhaps surprisingly, but I, I, you know, I'm, I'm you know, deep diving into um, what servant leadership is all about, you know, discovering what purpose is about for our organizations and for our teams within our organizations and for ourselves and our close colleagues um, within those uh, contexts. Um, making sure there's a good alignment between the values that the um, organization claims um, and the way that people actually do their work. Um, so what I've done at the bottom is taken the nine values from the Kanban method and then thought about how should those be reflected in an effective organization that considers itself to be doing something um, lean and or agile or lean agile. Um, you know, there's that common thread going through it and, and the idea is the agenda for change um, is driving us in the direction of better exemplifying the values that we claim. Um, it doesn't have to be those nine Kanban values. It could be values that are um, much more um, specific, unique, special um, about the organization. That's something that we can uh, work with organizations to, um, to, to develop. Um, 
that middle layer, the alignment, um, that's about those feedback loops. How do we make sure that we are actually delivering on the outcomes for our users that we want to? Um, are we regularly making sure that we are actually making progress on our agenda for change? Um, does your management team maintain a backlog of organizational changes, for example? Um, are you regularly doing that as a, as a team? Um, is there follow-up from one retrospective to another, um, for example? Um, are we aligned what, on what fit for purpose looks like? Are we aligned on what a meaningful existence for our staff and our organizations um, look like? Um, there's a very easy way to destroy meaning, and that's just to keep reallocating work from people and to micromanage them after you've done that. Um, giving people the space to work out what they're doing and how they're contributing, to, contributing towards the purpose of their, their teams and the wider organization, and how the wider organization itself contributes um, into um, its marketplace and even into society. Um, that actually is what, um, I'm digging deep again, what servant leadership is all about. It's not just about helping teams. It's not just about serving pro process, especially not about just serving process. It's about connecting people to purpose. Um, that's why it needs to be a discovery thing. That's why we need to keep exploring it. Uh, and that's what will make um, that thing in the middle, that agenda for change, um, something really significant. And if we can connect the bottom and the top, what we do and what we're discovering together, uh, we'll be in a much better place, I think. So that's what I've been working on for the last uh, year or so. Um, if you'll have me back at some point in the future, I'll tell you a bit more about that, take you through the model in a bit more detail. We can talk either in the context of servant leadership specifically, uh, which is something I made a bit of a study on, um, or um, in the context of customer focus. Um, so think about how uh, customer focus fits into, into that matrix, um, and how lean agile transformation works as well. So you can overlay sort of journeys through this matrix, um, representing different transformation strategies and the pitfalls that transformations often fall into. Um, so that's not this talk, that's another one. I'd have to be here for another hour. <laughs> um, that's me done. Uh, so over to you. Uh, I'm not sure what the time is. It is... So we have a... A little... Yes, okay. Um, well, I'm... Um, I'm whizzing off to Chesterfield after we're done, but I will hang around a little bit for questions. Um, if you want to see what the assessment tool looks like, uh, very simple, agendashift.com slash 2016 will take you to this year's survey. Um, this year's survey doesn't use the, the big 43 prompt version that last year's did. It's just 18 prompts, just three questions in six categories. It just gives you a taste of, of what it works. But if you do it thoughtfully, genuinely thinking about um, your, um, your, just your team or perhaps more usefully your end-to-end -end process, I think you'll find the, the questions helpfully provocative. <laughs>